Hello. Um, today I wanted to talk a bit about the EU referendum which is coming up in Britain um, in June 2016. This is a referendum about whether we should stay in the EU or not, the European Union. Um, I'm basically trying to figure out uh, which way I should vote. Um, and so I thought I'd talk about it. I've been kind of leaning anti-EU lately, but I'm, I'm open to changing my mind. Um, we'll see. I think um, there's a lot of issues, and I don't think we in Britain know enough about them. Certainly I don't. Um, and the information I read from different sources can be wildly different, and that doesn't help. Um, for example, I read on a BBC website that Britain pays in £76 billion a year to the EU, and yet when I go and look up the figures, officially, um, from Treasury figures, it's £8.5 billion, which is a big difference. Um, so, with all the rubbish in the news, it makes it very hard to make up your mind sensibly. Um, actually. Um, I will say that originally, back in 1973, was it, when Britain joined, something like that, um, I was in favour. <coughs> um, it was 1974, I think, Britain held a referendum um, because the previous government had taken us or got us to join the EU without a referendum, actually. Just, oh, let, let's do it, you know. Um, but the following government um, uh, that, that Prime Minister was immediately kicked out and uh, a new government came in um, and they held a referendum and there we were told we were joining the common market it was a trading um, well organization basically um, and the idea was that we would be trading with other European countries on a sort of preferential basis um, and it would be good for business, and that's what we were told. And we were not told that it was going to be a European super state. However, I remember, I was a teenager then, I couldn't vote, but I remember thinking that these people were dissembling. It was obvious, I mean, it was really obvious that what they were trying to do was build a European super state. Um, and I'm surprised that people complain about having been deceived in the past because it was it really was. Then nobody would say it, but it, it was it was obvious. Um, the idea was to build a federal Europe like the USA as a federal non-Europe, <laughs> um, a federal America. Right. Um, that that was the idea, um, and I was in favour of it. I mean, you could look at America and see how successful it's been financially. It has its big problems, racism, violence, um, stupidly expensive medical care, things of this sort, um, but in terms of making money and good standard of living, if you're not one of the poorest 10%, you're actually really well off over there compared with anywhere else. Um, so I was in favour. However, when I look at it, <coughs> how it's gone, nothing really has, has improved. Um, and I wanted to talk about that really. I, I, don't, I don't think the EU has done much um, for me or for Britain um, or indeed for Europe. Um, in travelling to Europe I see European flags everywhere and <clears throat> there are festivals and things like that so the European propaganda is running well in Europe um, and they all watch the Euro news over there and, and we don't over here. Um, I'll talk about the media later. <clears throat> um, so maybe over there there's more people that believe in it um, but here we don't even know much about it frankly. So I've got some notes down here. I need lots of notes because it's a complicated subject actually. I'm trying to think about it uh, it's a total headache, actually. I can listen to all the propaganda on YouTube and elsewhere, and I don't know fact from fiction. 
at the end of the day. I've been trying to sort it out a bit. So anyway, it started out as a coal and steel union because we were trying to save the big industries of Europe, um, which were suffering from competition around the world, China and places like that, way back in the 60s. Then it became the common market and we joined. And then it became the European community, um, which was a kind of a rebranding of it. And eventually they had the single European Act and it became the European Union, the super state. <coughs> It's still not really a super state, but it's they're trying hard to integrate it. And there are good reasons to do so. Um, in particular, the memory of World War I and World War II, which were, although they were world wars, they were really European civil wars. Um, and <coughs> millions of people were killed, of course. Um, and really it's a good idea to try and stop that happening again. But I don't think that's very likely to happen, but certainly with the way politics is at the moment, it's it seems quite unlikely. I mean, the European countries are all in NATO anyway, um, so how are they going to be attacking each other apart from Turkey and Greece? Um, and the rest of NATO may well intervene should they go to, to war properly anyway to stop them. So. In a sense, you could argue that NATO is already doing the job and we don't need a Europe, a European Union, to stop World War III uh, within Europe. Obviously, the United States and Russia and China might all bomb the world to, to smithereens at some point, but they're not part of the EU. Um, so, um, One of the good things, I think, about the European Union is it, that human rights is enshrined in the constitution such as it is in the legislation. There is, And in Britain we have a lot of protest about the Human Rights Act. Um, I don't know whether the particular act is a good thing or not, but I do think that human rights should be part of a country's constitution. Um, and if, like Britain, it doesn't have that sort of a constitution where you can do that, then it must um, at least be in the legislation somehow. And maybe a British British Human Rights Act would be better, could be done better. Um, as long as there is something, I don't mind whether it comes from Europe or, or wherever, but certainly our fundamental rights should be protected in law um, and enforced as well. I know there's been lots of problems with um, piss-taking Muslims um, terrorist sympathisers um, using the Human Rights Act to prevent themselves being deported and, and so on, but um, in the end they were, and, and yes, I mean, uh, there will always, criminals will always exploit loopholes and difficulty with the law. Um, I think you don't have to worry about trivia like that, to be honest. Um, um, <clears throat> One of the problems I've seen with the EU, though, is its <clears throat> apparent lack of respect for democracy. I mean, when you look at the institutions, they all seem to be carefully designed to protect rights and democracy and so on. But when you look at the way it runs, it doesn't seem to respect democracy. Uh, for example, there's a history of it, or appears to be a history of it, ignoring referenda, like... Um, for instance, in 2001, um, when they implemented the Treaty of Nice, um, Ireland, because of its constitution, had to have a referendum about it, and they voted against. Um, yet in 2002, they had to have another referendum on it, and this time they voted in favour. So having got the wrong answer, they had to hold another referendum, right? Now that's a bit suspicious to me. I think, however, only about 34% of the Irish turned out to vote in that first referendum. So it could be argued, really, that there wasn't a sufficient quorum. Um, but still, in the second one, it was only about 46% bothered to turn out. Nobody was interested, clearly. Um, so maybe because of that, you could, you could argue that, well, they should have had another vote because they didn't bother to vote in the first place. <laughs> um, 
Then we have the Treaty of Maastricht in uh, 1992. Denmark voted against it. Um, but then they negotiated some opt-outs, about four different opt-outs from certain things such as the um, Euro and, and uh, um, European Justice System and a couple of other things which they've opted out of. And they voted again in 2002, a year later, and this time they agreed. So again, you could argue it's a new vote because they'd, have, they'd negotiated some opt-outs. It's a bit, what, a bit like what David Cameron is trying to do at the moment with some, what I see as some very, very minor concessions being asked for and mostly refused by the EU. Um, and now we're going to have a vote on it. Um, the next one was the attempt to bring in the EU constitution in 2005. Um, but France and the Netherlands voted against it in referenda. And so the other countries didn't bother to hold a referenda because because of the nature of a constitutional vote. If somebody votes against it at that time, that was that was it, scuppered. Um, but what they did instead was bring in the Treaty of Lisbon, which was based on much of the failed constitution or refused con constitution. This could be implemented by amendments to previous treaties, like the Maastricht Treaty, um, and through ordinary legislation instead. So there was no need for most countries or all countries to hold a referenda. Ireland did have to hold a referendum, though, again. Um, <clears throat> and they turned it down in 2008. Um, again, they negotiated a couple of opt-outs, um, like the right to... Um, keep abortion illegal and things like that. And then they voted in favour in 2009. Again, you could argue that they got it wrong, so they were made to have another vote, but also they, they negotiated some changes. So maybe that is kind of democracy. But I rather feel that other countries should have had a referenda as well, really. Um, so the Treaty of Lisbon was in effect the EU constitution implemented <coughs> by the back door and I don't like that sort of political shenanigan making it's it's um, dishonest really um, so we have questions over Europe's commitment to democracy um, I know that democracy is a bad system um, it's the best system but it's still pretty bad because obviously we humans, we are largely a bit stupid, we're terribly selfish, we're quite irresponsible and we vote accordingly. Um, and that means it's very, very hard for the world to make good progress um, in improving society because we vote according to our own vested interests and that is not always what's best um, from the larger point of view. If we were more cooperative and well-meaning towards each other, we would probably vote differently quite often. But human nature is human nature and we've got to live with it and democracy is perhaps the best way we can live with that. Um, I certainly don't think any dictator telling us what to do is going to work um, at all. Um, we can see from history how terrible uh, plenty of dictators have been. Uh, if you've had a, a bad boss at work, you know what a dictatorship is like. Okay, uh, Stupid decisions enforced stupidly and good decisions, you get blamed for them. So what's the point? Um, right. Um, now, it's wrong to suppose that Britain couldn't leave the EU. Um, we can, of course. Um, Greenland left the EU way back in 1973. Um, and also it's wrong to suppose that it's not possible for us to have freedom of movement limited in this country. Um, the EU just doesn't want to do it, obviously. It's good for business, uh, they think. Um, Switzerland, um, which is not in the EU, but it has lots of agreements, um, they agreed to freedom of movement with the EU in 2005. However, in 2014, they voted to have this freedom of movement limited and restricted. Um, so they've got that. It can be done. 
Um, it's just that the EU doesn't want to do it with Britain. Um, everybody wants to escape from Europe to Britain, it seems, and get a job in London. <coughs> um, and, of course, this is annoying British workers who are getting priced out of the property market and um, priced out of jobs as well, uh, sometimes, because <coughs> a load of foreigners can come here and live like three families or four families to a house. Uh, British people obviously don't want to do that. They want to raise children here. Um, they can't afford it. Four families in a house can afford the rent. One family in a house can, with both parties, both partners working, can barely afford the rents. A low rent in London is £1,200 a month for a small flat. Um, flats down the road from where I am, studio flats, which is like a, a bed sit with a separate kitchen and a separate bathroom. Um, that's a bed sitting room. Uh, are seventeen hundred pounds a month. Who can afford that? How how are people affording it? They they went they were snapped up uh, when they when they went on the market. They they were rented out quickly. But it baffles me how people can afford that. They must be paying like eighty percent of their wages to, to pay for these places. Uh, and this is so non-prudent. Um, and it has to be said that uh, a recent poll indicated that over 60%, I think it was, of young people in London were planning to leave because they could not afford accommodation in London, so they're looking to go elsewhere in the country. But the trouble is their jobs are in London. Most of the jobs in the country seem to be in London. Um, you can go to some country town and, and there's nothing to do. Right. Um, even the bigger cities up north are not that great for jobs compared with London. Um, but the accommodation is a bit cheaper. So there's been a failure of the British government to manage this. Uh, and we do need the cheap workers from Europe, as business says, to pay for the pensions for our ageing population. However, if the young people could afford to have kids, um, that wouldn't be a problem and the property market needs to be managed if we're going to do that. So this is a, a British government failure, really. They've had this free market dogma um, since Margaret Thatcher um, and I'm afraid it's not working anymore. The bubble is hugely inflated um, and I think the average price of a house in London is well over £600,000 now. It's just when the average wage is £27,000, £26,000, it's, it's hopeless, absolutely hopeless for most people. Um, now there's, there's questions of the lack of a dem democracy and uh, uh, accountability in Europe in other ways too. Not just the fact that they don't like to uh, look at referendum results, but also that they um, we don't know who they are, basically. Now you could say it's our fault, we should look it up, but people are busy. We're, we're running as fast as we can to stand still financially in this country, because we can't afford anything nowadays almost, certainly property. As I've mentioned, um, we don't have the time for it, you know. Um, but I mean, when you look at the EU, there are structures in place. I've got my notes here, I have to refer to them because it's kind of complicated. Um, but people are concerned that it's not really democratic enough. Like, that we have MEPs, members of the European Parliament, but they're not allowed to introduce legislation. And I know Nigel Farage of, of the um, UKIP. UK Independence Party has made a lot of noise about this, uh, saying how undemocratic it is. In, in the British Parliament, an MP can uh, put up a, what's known as a private member's bill. They can introduce their own legislation. Now, 99% of those private member's bills get kicked out because there's kind of a procedure it has to go through and they, they, don't, they don't usually pass anyway. Um, but sometimes they get enough support that they can be adopted by the government or at least Parliament gets to vote on it. So 
they can with difficulty get some bills through or make enough noise and it happens. In the EU the MEPs cannot do this. Legislation is introduced by the European Commission instead, which is a body of appointed ministers. Uh, I think one from each member state is appointed by the member state's government to the Commission. Um, what the MEPs can do, though, is ask the Commission to introduce laws about certain subjects, and then the Commission go and draw up the laws and introduce them. So there is a roundabout way of them doing it, but I think, I don't know if an individual MEP can do that or if they have to, as a Parliament, get together and ask for it. I don't know what the procedure is. Um, but there is a kind of a way around it, so it's not as bad as perhaps has been stated. Um, what the, what the European Commission does is it, it introduces legislation, um, it manages um, the EU's funding, that is, it, uh, it oversees it um, and allocates general funding, um, and it represents the EU internationally. Um, the Commission and the ministers on it uh, will go to other countries and, and negotiate on behalf of the EU as a whole. Um, and there's also an EU president, and his job is to decide the general direction of policy for the Commission. Um, however, there's another body, the Council, the European Council, which sets the broad priorities which the President has to follow. Um, and there's also a Council of the EU, which represents the individual countries, to the Commission. It's, it's kind of complicated. But at least there is some. There are mechanisms in place to try and get these things to go. I don't know how well they work. Um, the European Commission also tries to enforce European law, um, not very effectively, I would say, in some countries. Um, <clears throat> but you can go on their website and complain if you want to. <clears throat> there is a, a thing to say that I don't think this law is being enforced. So go and tell them. Um, what the MPs, the MEPs can do is they pass laws when they're presented to them, or reject them. Um, they decide on international agreements that the Commission have negotiated. Um, they decide on enlargements when countries want to join the EU. Um, I think the EU maybe has been over-enlarged of late, um, or enlarged a bit too rapidly, but that's up to them, I guess. Uh, and they also they did they elect the commission the EU Commission president uh, as well. They also elect the president of the European Council, and they supervise the budget as well, which which the commission sets. Um, so there are swings and roundabouts or, or checks and balances, as it's known, um, within the EU. <clears throat> but in Britain, I think we don't get the impression that it works very well. But I have to say it is not reported very well either. Um, Britain is a very insular country and the media are, especially the mass media, not the intellectual papers, but the mass media are biased. Um, they will say anything to make you buy the paper. That they, they write utter rubbish a lot of the time. Um, and they they will report on the EU when there's some scandal or that when they when they 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 see that they can get people outraged about how bent our bananas are or cucumbers are allowed to be, um, but they don't report on good European news generally, so we don't get to hear it. Sure, there's the uh, Euro News TV channel, but it's not watched over here, um, or hardly. Um, I think it's quite a popular channel in mainland Europe. But in Britain, we're, we are insular and our media and government, I think, encourage this insularity um, or pander to it. Uh, that there's no broader um, idealistic thinking, really. Um, we're a very selfish country and the media and the government who should be trying to improve us are not doing their job. Um, in that way at all. Um, so we don't know who is the President of the European Commission, who is the President of the European Council, do you know? Um, who's the Finance Minister? How many of you know that? Eh? 
Um, what laws have been passed recently in Europe? I don't know. I haven't a clue. At least when the media report the, the, the British news, they'll say, you know, this member of parliament insulted that member of parliament or David Cameron, the prime minister, said this and his opposition, the opposition leader, currently Jeremy Corbyn, said that. And, and we get a vague idea of what bills are being discussed and what laws are being introduced and, and it's talked about in the papers a bit. Um, but frankly, I think the vast majority of people have zero idea of what Europe is and the European government's or government structure is up to at all, um, other than apparently trying to interfere in our affairs all the time and spend our money, as, as, as the papers claim. Um, and this in itself is a kind of um, lack of democracy, because for a system to be democratic, the people have to be informed. Um, and whether deliberately or by, de or by default, the British people are not being informed. And so it would not surprise me if we voted to leave, voted for Brexit, as it's called, British exit, because we have no clue, frankly, as to what Europe is up to. And when you don't know what someone is doing or something is doing, you tend to think the, think the worst, of course. Um, this, is, this is normal human nature as well. Um, when I read about the EU, I can see that they are trying to do good things. Um, they're a little, I would say they're, they're rather too socialist about it, for my liking. I, I think you do need some a mixed economy, some capitalism, some socialism. I would say Europe is far too bureaucratic and far too ready to spend money um, rather than be sensible. And I'll talk about Europe's failures um, in a minute. Um, But in short, we know very little about Europe um, in this country. And that is probably a big reason why a lot of people are anti-Europe. Um, the European propaganda does not work over here. We hardly hear it. OK. Um, so maybe the leadership of this country want us out. Or maybe they're just incompetent. Um, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, so, European failures, this is important, because Europe was supposed to um, bring the countries together and spread best practice between the countries so that they would all rise up together and become wealthier. And over the last 30, 40 years, that has not happened. I don't see it. We, we've had some harmonizations. The road traffic signs are all the same. Well, big deal, you know. Um, they have not managed to enrich the poor countries of Europe, Greece, Italy, Spain. And why have they not done it? Because they have failed to tackle corruption. Um, they have failed to introduce the best practices of business from countries like Britain and Germany who really do know how to make money and, and work hard and, and run business. Uh, you go to even France uh, and, the, and it's much, much less efficient, actually. They're, they're doing quite well, but they are much less efficient than Britain. Um, and Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, and these, uh, Portugal, they're just, they're just hopeless. And uh, it seems like nothing has been done to improve these countries or to get them to introduce legislation where business can be freed up to work um, effectively. I mean, in Greece, to start a business, you have to get agreement from other local businesses for you to do it. So how can you start a competitive business when your competitors have to agree to your existence? It can take 10 or 20 years to set up a business in Greece. It's very, very tough. Um, so no wonder the country is broke. Okay, it's also extremely corrupt, and worldwide the richest countries are the least corrupt countries. Um, what has Europe done to tackle this corruption? I don't know. In Italy, it used to be run by the mafia, it's still infested with these crooks, and 
well, how come? What is the EU doing? Um, the country will always remain poor while parasites are allowed to suck the wealth from companies who should be investing in themselves. Um, so this is a big, big failure by the EU. Um, the business practices of Britain and Germany in particular really should be promoted and pushed and probably even enforced throughout these other countries of Europe to make it work. Then Europe would get rich and it would also solve the um, immigration crisis um, in terms of movement of Eastern Europeans to uh, Britain anyway because they would have opportunities at home. Um, so it's massive failure to do this over the last 30, 40 years is testament to the fact that it isn't working. For me, that is the key thing. The lack of democracy is another key um, factor in my decision. Um, it's very hard to see how democratic the EU is, but there are worrying signs that it's not. It doesn't really have respect for what people believe. Um, that failure to limit the freedom of movement question is another one. Um, now, freedom of movement is, in theory, a great idea because people can move to where um, the money is, where businesses need them because there's jobs, um, and that's more efficient. They'll also probably claim lower wages, which is more efficient for the businesses but not for the workers who are being kicked out of their jobs for, because somebody else can do it more cheaply in the short term. In the long term, it's probably good, but in the short term, it's, it's a big upheaval for people. Um, and it also means that we in Britain, for instance, have to spend an awful lot on infrastructure. Um, new schools, new hospitals, um, more traffic on the roads, property prices shooting up because of the extra population. Um, and this is causing a lot of anger in the country. Um, it probably needed to be done, but not at such a great speed. And also, if the local population could be encouraged to breed, uh, i.e. by keeping our cost of living down so that we actually are able to look after our own children uh, without having to pay fortunes for childcare and go to work, um, actually we wouldn't need these immigrants from other parts of Europe or the world. Um, and actually the government is trying to tackle this immigration crisis by limiting the number that are coming from elsewhere in the world other than Europe, um, which is very bad, it's stupid actually, because we can let in any old Romanian criminal um, and we can't even deport them, and yet a highly qualified doctor from India um, will have big trouble trying to get a visa, a working visa in this country now. Um, and may have to leave, um, indeed. So, we will let in any old riffraff from Eastern Europe, from these retarded, underdeveloped, corrupt countries, and we will not let in highly educated, university educated, highly skilled, intelligent people, hard-working, people of good character from the rest of the world, this, this has to be so imbecilic um, as, as to be, it beggars belief, really. Um, but this is what EU law um, brings us to. Um, of course, a stupid person can move from one part of England to London as well, um, and a crook can. Um, it's the same thing, but... We, need, we do need to allow the freedom of movement, but it does need to be restricted uh, or limited. <clears throat> and I think we do need to be able to control who comes here. And we also need to be able to allow a, a decent number of hard-working, intelligent people from the rest of the world to come here as well. We need those people too. I mean, we, we don't need um, criminal gangs from Bulgaria, Romania and places like that. Um, actually. Um, 
another failure of the EU is that it's, it is failing to be seen to be democratic. Whether it is or not, in Britain, we can't see it. Um, so what happens if Britain does leave the EU? Um, will it make us better off financially or worse off? I mean, people are only really concerned with whether Britain will be better off financially or not. We're not the British public are not apparently concerned with what, what effect it would have on human rights or um, things like that. They want to know, will property prices crash? Will, will jobs disappear because companies will close because they can't trade with the EU or not? There are arguments on both sides. It's, we could, when, we, when we joined the EU, the British Commonwealth was suddenly cut off because the EU has <coughs> tariff barriers. You can't import to the EU from outside the EU without paying various fees unless you're part of some international trade agreement. Um, and this, at the time, impoverished many of the British Commonwealth countries. It was a major betrayal of them, to be honest. Um, and I thought it was sad that we couldn't do that. But the EU immorally has these, and hypocritically has these tariffs. Um, whilst arguing that free trade is a good thing within the EU. <clears throat> if we were to leave the EU, of course the Commonwealth would now no longer be stuck behind these tariff barriers and it could trade with us again and some industries would have to be rebuilt um, and so on. It would be different. Um, but in Britain, just like we hardly hear about the EU, we hardly hear about the Commonwealth either. Um, Canada might as well not exist. We occasionally hear a story about Australia and Bondi Beach or something. Um, sometimes, occasionally in New Zealand, there's an earthquake. Other than that, we, we hardly hear about the Commonwealth at all. And yet the Commonwealth uh, has a population of about a quarter of the planet's population. Over, over one and a half billion people, I think, live in the British Commonwealth. Far more than live in Europe. Three times as much, something like that. So we can trade with them. And we can trade with the EU because we are an important market for the EU. And they can arrange a trade agreement whereby we don't have tariff barriers with them. They may want to put tariff barriers up, but that will damage their own industries too, who sell to us. Because the tariff barriers would, of course, be mutual. They would work both ways. So it would obviously cause a lot of upheaval in the short term. And very likely there would be some job losses, um, a depression or not a recession, let's say. We're already in an economic depression worldwide, I think, and Europe certainly is, is in a bad way economically, um, worse than Britain. Um, so we could expect a year or maybe two of upheaval. Um, but I think things would recover pretty quickly. It doesn't take long to negotiate agreements with other countries. People are saying, oh, it would take 10 years to negotiate a agreements with other countries. This is not true. That's longer than it took us to fight World War II, for goodness sake. I think we could manage to send a few stooges out to different countries and negotiate with them. It's, it's, there's enough bureaucrats around who can do the job. Um, so, should we stay or should we go? I haven't made up my mind. But I think, certainly, if we were to leave, Britain would be OK. Um, yes, a short bit of upheaval. Um, and maybe I would lose my job, other people would lose theirs. But in the long run, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, some people say that we should leave because we are paying vast amounts of money into Europe every year. I've seen different figures for this. The BBC website told me 76 billion. And yet, when I look it up, it's 8.5 billion. And we get a lot of that back in subsidies. Some farms, some farms are subsidised um, because Europe tries to maintain a degree of independence on its food production, rightly so, because famines happen from time to time. Although we do get stupid things like butter mountains and wine lakes and so on, which are not controlled properly. Um, and the common agricultural policy is dominated by French farmers. Um, so again, it's something which they have singularly fail to reform. But we get subsidies back for that. We get subsidies back for a lot of British industries to develop um, 
like uh, Rolls-Royce got gets subsidy for uh, to develop cleaner aircraft engines, which will benefit all of us. Um, the Southwest Main Line train route has received big subsidy. Um, businesses all over receive subsidies and from the EU. So a lot of the money we pay in comes back. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, actually the Confederation for British Industry, CBI, also receives money from the EU. And I suspect we should bear that in mind when listening to their pronouncements on the subject of Brexit. Um, So, and that instantly that eight and a half billion that we pay in, of which we get about probably half back in subsidies, estimated, um, represents only about one percent, just over, of our government's annual expenditure. It's not much. It's actually a pittance, and the complaints we hear about it are out of proportion. That that it really is nothing much. It would have been more. It would have been a lot more, but Margaret Thatcher. Um, negotiated uh, um, rebates <coughs> and we still get them and so does Germany and so do certain other, other countries they get rebates as well actually um, so we're not actually paying in that much and we have our government who can decide where our money is spent and the EU decides where it's spent as well but some of it does come back to us it's not that much of an expenditure actually uh, as to whether it's a good thing to exit or not, it depends. <clears throat> do you believe in the European ideals? Um, do you believe that we are still spending too much? Um, I don't know. It's, it's very hard to figure it out. But we've got until June. It's March now, at the time I make this video. We'll see. Maybe the media will start reporting seriously on the subject by the time it comes up. Um, because British people are largely concerned with money, I suspect they will end up voting to stay in because they'll believe scare stories about about losing jobs and stuff. Um, and I would want to find out how much this is how much of it is that these scare stories are actually true or not. Um, at the moment it's all talk and hot air. I'm I'm gonna keep my eyes open for facts and if I find some maybe I'll I'll make a note and maybe make another video closer to the time. But for now I don't know how to vote. So maybe put your ideas in the comments below. Uh, subscribe if you like this vlog. Um, and if you're really keen, go to patreon.com slash alphadukana and even sponsor my channel. That would be great. So anyway, um, bye for now. And I'll see you again shortly, hopefully. Bye.